Good evening, friends, and again, welcome to Inspiration, the Bible's greatest stories. We would like to welcome you here in the Las Vegas area. Thank you for coming out again this evening. We also want to welcome those who are joining us online on the various television networks across the country and literally around the world. We've been going through some of the greatest stories in the Bible, and not only looking at the story, but also looking at how these stories illustrate the gospel. Tonight, we're going to be looking at a great Bible story found in the Old Testament. The presentation tonight is entitled, Running from God. Now, what Bible character do we read about that ran from God, at least tried to run from God? That's Jonah. We're going to be learning more about the story of Jonah this evening. Actually, our free gift that we have is a book that talks about that. It's called The Sign of Jonah. And this is our free gift. For those of you who are here in person, you'll receive this as you leave. For those watching online, if you'd like to receive a digital copy of the book, all you need to do is text the word Jonah to the number 40544. And if you're outside of North America, we want to encourage you to visit the website greateststories.org, and you'll be able to download a copy of the book. You can read it and then share it to somebody else. It's called The Sign of Jonah, and it's talking about that great Old Testament story. Well, as, we, as you know, we have a theme song, and we don't want to get to our study without first singing our theme song. So I'd like to invite the singers and sing heartily wonderful words of life. Well, let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father, we are indeed grateful for your word. We are grateful for those wonderful words of life. And as we open up the scriptures again tonight, we ask for the Holy Spirit to be with us here as well as those who are watching. And Lord, lead us into a fuller and a deeper understanding of scripture. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As I mentioned a little while ago, our presentation tonight is talking about Jonah, the story of Jonah, and we're just so happy that Pastor Doug is able to unpack these wonderful Bible stories for us. Pastor Doug, come on over. We, we were talking a little bit earlier today about the story of Jonah, and it was amazing all of the different um, parallels between the life of Christ and the experience of Jonah. Uh, there's so many lessons that we can learn. It's, it's really a gospel story in the Old Testament. Amen. And as we were talking, you mentioned something that I had forgotten about. And so it's a fascinating study, probably one of my favorites in the Bible. I really mean that. Great. Well, we're going to get right to it. Thank, thank you, Pastor, Pastor Ross. And I want to welcome everybody again. Uh, thank you for the folks here that are hosting this event at the Paradise Church here in Las Vegas. We really appreciate it, your kindness in coming and your, your good support. also want to thank our media team, the people who are helping with the video and the audio, and uh, local pastor Peter Neri who has been so kind in making this facility available. Can you say amen? amen? That's just wonderful. We looked into renting something here into town. And I'll tell you, that's, uh, you'd have to win the jackpot. And that wouldn't look good if I was down there trying to do that. So I'm really thankful that uh, they made this facility available. 
Well, we're going to be talking tonight about, as I mentioned, one of the great stories in the Bible. And it's not only great because it moves and touches me, it's great because Jesus says it's great. Amen. Talking about running from God and the sign of Jonah. It goes along with the book that was mentioned earlier. Jesus, speaking about Jonah, says this, Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said that the experience and story of Jonah, the sign of Jonah, was a sign about Christ and his mission and has a lot of lessons for God's people, both in the Old Testament and to each of us today. Now, the first thing that I notice when we start to talk about the sign of Jonah is uh, people say, well, you know, that, that's a, a fable, this idea about this man being swallowed by a fish for three days and three nights, you don't really believe that's true, do you? I do. I absolutely believe it's true. For one reason, if this was the only reason, it's reason enough. Jesus says it's true. And that should settle it. I mean, you're not going to believe what Jesus says and don't bother wasting your time with the Bible because He is the Word and He is the final authority. But I think there's also evidence that it's true. I was listening years ago to a radio broadcast by J. Vernon McGee, you remember him, through the Bible, a deep southern accent. And he cited three cases in modern history of people that had been swallowed by various kinds of sea creatures and survived. Indeed, I did an amazing fact about a man who was swallowed by a whale for 30 seconds last year. He was lobster fishing. He got inhaled by a whale by accident. It's what they call a baleen whale. They don't even have teeth. The whale didn't like it any more than the man. But he was in there and he's going, what in the world happened? He thought, I'm dead. It went all dark, but he still had his scuba gear on so he could breathe. And the whale spit him back out. And then you've got an interesting story in history about James Bartley, who was a whaler. And he was with a ship called the Star of the East off the Falkland Islands. When they were chasing a whale, they harpooned an 80-foot sperm whale. And it ended up ramming the boat broke one boat to smithereens, two sailors disappeared. Uh, later, the whale that had been speared floated to the surface, and the crew somberly towed it alongside and began to carve it up. They didn't hoist the whale up on the boat, and they couldn't do that. They'd actually do it as they strapped it alongside the boat. The next morning, they continued their work, and when they got down to the in innards, they saw something moving in the stomach. They opened it up thinking there was still a live squid inside, and there was their crewmate, James Bartley. Not James Barkley, the basketball player. This is Bar or Charles Barkley. <laughs> this is James Bartley. And he, um, unconscious, they washed him off on the deck, put him in the captain's cabin. He eventually came to, and he said he just knew that he had been enveloped in this, was being sucked down this tube, and then in this chamber that was very hot, and there was some air, and eventually he passed out, and that's all he remembered. He survived. And you got a picture of him, or a crude painting anyway, and uh, the report. Uh, when he got back to England, he gave up sailing, as you might imagine. <laughs> and you can still find his grave, and it says, Modern Jonah, James Bartley. So there's stories of this, but I believe it because Jesus said it. I remember one time hearing a uh, story about a, a lady that was riding on a bus to babysit. Every day she rode the same bus to babysit for her daughter in the morning as the daughter went to work. And this attorney would also ride. And the attorney was an atheist. He noticed every day this woman would be reading her Bible. He was a gentleman. He'd often get up and give her his seat. And he'd see her reading her Bible on the bus. And finally he couldn't help himself. They knew each other. And he called her grandma. And he said, now, Grandma, I see you reading the Bible every day. I just wonder, do you really believe that the stories in there are true? She said, absolutely, son. She said, uh, these stories are true. It's the Word of God. God said it. He said, you believe the story about Adam and Eve actually happened, Garden of Eden, talking snake? I believe it. God said it. I believe it. He said, and you believe Noah and the ark and the whole world being flooded and the animals came two by two? 
God said it, I believe it. So I suppose you believe that Jonah was swallowed by a whale for three days and three nights and came out alive. Absolutely, it's in the Word of God. I believe the Word of God. How can a man, he asked, live inside a whale for three days and three nights? She said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. <laughs> and he said, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? She said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> so, God's Word says it. Now, not only does Jesus say it's true, but if you look in, you look in 2 Kings 14, it talks about Jonah, the prophet, from Gath Hefer, who lived during the time of Jeroboam the second. That was 790 to 750 BC. He is a real person. The Bible, all the Bible authors speak about Jonah as a real person. In fact, I don't know if you caught it, but in 2014, it was very sad when the Islamic State was spreading back across Iraq. One of the things they did is they blew up the tomb of Jonah. It had been there for over 2,000 years. It was called Jonas, the tomb of Jonas, and it was part of their campaign to destroy religious sanctuaries that they thought were idolatrous. That was, uh, of course, a very sad event. But um, you'll find, of course, the book of Jonah in the Old Testament among the minor prophets. And if you'd go there with me very quickly, we're going to go through the story of Jonah, cover as much as we can, and see what we can learn about the truth and Jesus in this account. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise. First of all, the word of God will elevate. Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God said to the prophet, I want you to go warn the people of Nineveh. Judgment is coming because of their sins. Now, you can understand why he might be reluctant to do that. Because Nineveh was an enemy of Israel. And to have a Jewish prophet march up and down the streets in the capital of the Assyrian Empire and say, you're all going to be judged for your sins. I mean, even today, if a Jew was to walk back and forth in the West Bank among the Palestinians and say, you're all lost, God's going to punish you, you wouldn't last very long. And so he's reluctant to do this. So when he hears this message, instead of going to Nineveh, Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, um, I think I told you my mother was Jewish, and my mother's maiden name was Tarshish. And um, they had a Jewish settlement in Tarshish, which they believe was on the coast of Spain, not far away from the Straits of Gibraltar. For the civilized world, especially around the Mediterranean, if you wanted to talk about getting as far away as you could, you went to Tarshish. Today, we'd be saying he went all the way to Timbuktu. And that expression, going to Timbuktu, is because at one time that was the furthest, most remote marine outpost. We had a marine outpost in Timbuktu, and no one wanted to get stationed to Timbuktu. It was called the ends of the earth. So instead of Jonah going east to do his work, he goes west as far away as he can, like that prodigal son that went into a far country from his father. Strange thing is he's a prophet. He ought to know better. He went down to Joppa, and he found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare, and he went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. You know, I've always wondered, why would the devil be so dumb as to think that the creature could overpower the Creator? Now, to me, I would think right out of the box, if he's powerful enough to make me, then how can I think I can overcome him? But sin makes you do stupid things. How could a prophet think you could hide from God? You know, King David wrote, and he wrote it in time for Jonah to read it. You look in Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand will hold me. Can we hide from God? The eyes of the Lord run to and fro through the whole earth to show Himself powerful in the eyes, uh, in the lives of those who are loyal to Him. When our hearts are loyal to Him, God sees everything everywhere. You can't hide from God. 
The Bible says all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we have to do. We will all give an account. Jesus said those things done in secret will be proclaimed from the housetop unless they're washed away and under the blood of the Lamb. So that's one really good reason for me to accept Jesus because I don't want you to know about everything that he forgave me of. And so the best cover-up is surrender your life to Jesus and that old person be crucified, dead, and gone. Amen? Amen. But Jonah thinking he could run from God. How strange, especially for a prophet to think that. Now, sometimes I found that people can deceive themselves. Maybe Jonah was thinking, oh Lord, I don't want to go to Nineveh and talk to those pagans. We don't like him. Matter of fact, if you're going to judge them, let's not warn them, just judge them. You're supposed to love your enemies. He thought, best thing that could happen, Lord, wipe them out. So he said, if I go and warn them, maybe they'll repent and then God will forgive them. But I don't want them to be forgiven. The Assyrians had conquered the people of Israel in the northern kingdom. Uh, there wasn't a lot of love there. And then Jonah said, well, Lord, I, you pick someone else. Let me off the hook. And as Jonah is going the other direction, his conscience began to prod him. And he thought, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. I tell you what, I'll put a fleece out before the Lord. If I get down to Joppa and there is a ship going west, I'll assume it's okay. And so he gets to Joppa, and sure enough, there's a ship getting ready to leave and go west. And then he says, well, if the weather's good for sailing, the day of departure, I'll take it as a sign it's okay for me to not obey God. <laughs> Looks like the weather's good. They said, well, I still don't feel comfortable. I've got to pay the fare. If there's enough money in my pocket to pay the fare, he's got enough money. And there's just one space left. You know, sometimes we can talk ourselves into thinking running from God is okay. I'm a pastor. I've seen it many times. I'll be counseling some people. I had a man and a woman come into me and they said, Pastor, we're married to other people, but those marriages were mistakes and God brought us together. Now, they're still married to other people. <laughs> and they said, we just get along so well we know the Lord is in this. I said, what are you going to do with that commandment? You know the seventh one? Thou shalt not commit adultery? They had convinced themselves that somehow God was going to bless their adultery. It's amazing how people can rationalize. And Jonah, a prophet of God, I don't know what was going through his head, but I've seen people talk themselves into thinking that, well, since God isn't striking me with lightning, it must be okay. <laughs> you know, there's a statement that Solomon makes in the book of Ecclesiastes. I don't remember the reference, but I'll quote it for you. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully set in them to do evil. Because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, because God does not zap you with lightning every time you do something wrong, we think that his mercy is an excuse for continued sin. God is patient, God is loving, but eventually it will catch up with you. So Jonah is thinking that he can run from God. You can't run from God. So he goes down into the ship, and you know what's interesting? Jonah departs from Joppa because he does not want to preach to the Gentiles. 800 years later, there is another prophet that also sometimes was disobedient. And God spoke to him and said, I want you to go talk to the Gentiles. His name was the Apostle Peter. And he did it in Joppa. Peter had a vision on a roof in Joppa and said, I want you to go and talk to the Gentiles. He went to the house of Cornelius. Isn't that interesting? Peter picked up where Jonah left off. So Jonah goes down. He finds his cabin in the lowest parts of the ship. When you run from God, you end up in the lowest parts. God's word said, Arise. But when he departed from the Lord, it says Jonah went down, then he went down to the ship, then he goes down in the ship, and then he goes down from the ship. He continues to go down, down, down when he runs from God. And does God do that to make us miserable or to get our attention and save us? Sometimes God will send a storm to save you. But the Lord, verse 4, Jonah chapter 1, the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So the ship was about to be broken up. Sometimes God will send a storm to get our attention. Sometimes he's got to put a weight on your back to get you on your knees. 
Sometimes he's got us in trials to get you to look up. And we think it's because he doesn't love us. It's actually because he does love us. You can read in Hebrews 12 verse 5. Have you forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as sons? My son, and would also apply my daughter, do not despise the chastening of the Lord or be discouraged when you're rebuked by him. For he whom the Lord loves, he chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. You know, in the Bible, you read about Job. God loved Job, but Job went through a storm. It was just one thing after another. You ever notice sometimes these calamities and trials seem to come in threes. And uh, God sometimes is trying to shake us up to wake us up. By the way, friends, I believe a storm is coming to the world. Amen. Pastor Doug, are you making a prophecy? No, Jesus already made it. <laughs> Jesus said, the wise man, the one who hears my word and does it, is building on a rock. And when the storm comes, his house stands. The foolish man builds on the sand. He doesn't hear my, he hears my word, but he doesn't do it. And when the storm comes, his house falls. But you notice what Jesus said, the storm comes to the fool and the storm comes to the wise man. Before Jesus comes, there's going to be a big storm. The Bible calls it a time of trouble such as there never has been. Jesus implies that unless those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. I think right now, friends, we are on the threshold of some very interesting times, and it could be the providence of God. He's brought you to these programs, or you are watching this program because He wants to get your attention to turn your heart back to Him and get you to look up. Now, when a storm comes, you can either harden your heart and it leaves you dazed. You can become depressed or you can humble your heart and come to God and He will revive you. The Bible says, humble yourself and He will lift you up. Amen. I remember hearing a story, Max Lucado put it in his book called The Eye of the Storm. And it was about Chippy the parakeet. This lady had a parakeet, a little parakeet called Chippy. She kept in the kitchen and one day she was cleaning and vacuuming and she thought she'd go vacuum out the cage, the bottom of the seeds and stuff in the bottom of the cage and, and open up the cage and you know, she took the attachment off so you just had the vacuum hose and she's vacuuming and the phone rang. And she turned to answer the phone and didn't realize that she bumped the vacuum hose down, it pointed up and all of a sudden she heard <laughs> and she looked Chippy was gone, one little feather floating around. <laughs> she dropped the phone and she turned off the vacuum cleaner and she quickly tore it open and pulled out the vacuum bag and tore it open and, and there was Chippy still moving and she took him out and shook him off and he started to cough, little parakeet coughs and sneezes and, and he was covered with dust and dirt and rug pieces and she took him into the bathroom and put him under the faucet and then began to hose him off. And he looked really stunned by that and, and then she realized he was shivering. She got the hair dryer, of course, turned it on and <laughs> she blew him off and, and put him back in his cage. She seemed to be alive, told her friend about it. She told the paper. They thought that was a great story. <laughs> Newspaper reporter called a few days later to see how Chippy was doing. She said, I think he's okay, but he doesn't sing anymore. <laughs> he just sort of stares. <laughs> Some people go through storms and they don't embrace it and say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? When I'm going through a hard time, I say, Lord, whatever it is you want me to learn, help me learn it now so I don't have to go through this again. Amen? Amen. God wanted to wake Jonah up. And so, he said, the Lord sent out a storm. Psalm 119 verse 75, I know, O Lord, that your judgments are right and that in faithfulness you've afflicted me because He loves us. Jesus says in Revelation, as many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. So, welcome, invite the discipline of God because He's doing it to save you. And when this storm was a very bad storm, supernatural power, the mariners, the sailors, I'm in verse 5, Jonah chapter 1, they cried out to His God, small g, all these pagan gods of the sailors, and they threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. They're, they're ready to make any sacrifice. And it says, but Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship 
and lain down and was fast asleep. Now it's interesting. He's probably on a Phoenician ship. They kind of ruled the seas back and they would sail out of Joppa. And these are pagans, the Phoenicians. And uh, they're up on deck and they're praying. Now who on that boat had the best theology of God? Jonah. Jonah knows the most about God. Who on the boat is praying? The pagans. What is the prophet doing? Sleeping. What does Jesus say the church is going to be doing just before the second coming? Have you read Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins? Five are wise, five are foolish, and a hundred percent are sleeping. And if you listen carefully, you can almost hear the collective snore of the church at large. All these things happening in the world and people don't realize that we've, we've got very little time to get our lives right with God and to tell other people. That's our mission. Go and tell the world. Jonah's asleep. He should have been up on the deck conducting the prayer meeting and he's sleeping. Jonah was in the lowest part. So the captain, he goes down. He's looking for other things to throw overboard. And he says, what do you mean, O sleeper? He, he was indignant. He can't believe it. The boat's ready to fall apart and it's creaking and water's coming in and sloshing around Jonah and he's asleep in the storm. And he says, what do you mean, O sleeper, arise? Now the word of God is coming through the captain saying, arise. Call on your God. Perhaps God will consider us so that we may not perish. Now friends, G Jesus said no sign would be given but the sign of Jonah. Not only was Jonah asleep in a boat during a storm, but doesn't the Bible say Jesus was asleep in a boat during a storm? And the disciples came to him and said, Master, they asked the dumbest question in the Bible. Master, carest thou not that we are perishing? And they woke him up, just like the captain, who used the very same verbiage. And when they woke up Jonah, eventually the storm stops. And when they woke up Jesus, the storm stopped. Isn't that right? Amen. Jesus, like Jonah, they're both prophets. And when they spoke, something happened. But I'm getting ahead of myself now. So he comes up on deck. And they said to one another, Come now, let us cast lots, that we might know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Now, I used to wonder, what does this mean? And I did a little more study, and what was a lot? You know, sometimes we say drawing straws and you pick the short straw or you flip a coin. It wasn't quite like that. They, they found some examples of the ancient lot casting that they did where they would have a jar and they have, it had a narrow opening like a flower vase or something and you would get rocks that were all about the same size and you get like ten white rocks and one black rock and you'd shake it up and you'd go around the people that were being in the pool of uh, consideration and you drop out one rock at the foot of each person and whoever got the black rock, black rock, the lot was cast on him. So they had various ways of doing this and so they thought this storm is a supernatural storm. The gods, they thought, are mad at us. We need to find out who are the gods angry at. Somebody here on this boat is running from God or disobeying God. It's interesting how perceptive they were. They were absolutely right. It was a supernatural storm. So they cast lots and you'd never guess what happened. The lot fell. Who would have thunk? The lot fell on Jonah. And Jonah thought, I already know how this is going to end when they started casting lots. He knew he was running from God. He should have known better. You can't run from God. And when this happened, the lot fell on Jonah, verse 8. Then they said to him, please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? They begin to just fire these questions at him. What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country? Who are your people? They end up asking him seven questions. He says, I'm a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I worship the God that made everything all the other gods are made out of. He said, I worship the God of gods. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. You know, we read earlier this week that in that storm at sea, when Jesus calmed the sea, it said they were exceedingly afraid. Same words. They were exceedingly afraid and said, why have you done this? This is the big question. Why did you do this? 
It doesn't say he ever had a good answer. For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord. You know, the difference between the world and the Christian, the world is running from the presence of God. When Adam and Eve sinned and they were aware of their nakedness, instead of going to God and saying, Lord, we got a problem. We're having a wardrobe malfunction. <laughs> instead, they ran from God because they were afraid. And then you've got the people who realize their helplessness and they go to God. First question in the Bible is God asking, where are you? Actually, the first question is the devil questioning the word of God, saying, has God said? But the first question God asks is, where are you? First question in the New Testament is the wise men saying, where is he? We've been separated from God. He says, if you draw near to me, I will draw near to you. God wants to save us. When the prodigal son began coming home, as soon as the father saw him coming, the father ran out to meet him. God is desperate to save you. He gave his son to save you. He wants so much for you to be saved, but he can't force you. And if you keep running from God, you can keep running into trouble, and it can be fatal in the end. No, it will be fatal in the end if you keep running. But if you turn around, that's what repent means. If you stop running towards sin, that will destroy you. If you're running from the will of God, you'll be destroyed. Love not the world or the things of the world. Pardon me, but when I think of this verse, I think of the Las Vegas Strip. Because to me, it is the epitome of the things of the world that are sometimes very attractive. Love not the world, this is 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, or the things that are in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, it's not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is going to pass away and the lust thereof, but he that does the will of God will abide forever. God wants us to do his will. We can't always be running from God. Jonah knew what God's will was and he was running from it and he was going down, wasn't he? So they said, why did you do this? They had no answer for that one. Finally, they asked the seventh question. What shall we do with you? It's like what Pilate said. What shall I do with Jesus? Who is called Nazareth. The Christ. It says that they cast lots for Jonah. Were they casting lots by the cross of Christ? A lot of similarities in this story. What shall we do to you that the sea might be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard. They didn't want to do that. They said, We don't believe in human sacrifice. You find these Phoenician sailors were more civilized than others. They said, We're not going to do that. And so they're doing all they can. They're rowing hard to save themselves. Now, there's two stories in the Bible, in the New Testament, about Jesus where there's storms on the Sea of Galilee. One storm, he's sleeping in the boat, and they wake him up, and he saves them. The other storm, they're rowing, and they can't get to shore, and he saves them. So here you've got the sailors in one story, part of the story, Jonah's asleep, and the other part of the story it says the sailors are rowing to save themselves and they're being unsuccessful. The disciples were rowing and they weren't getting anywhere. So they invited Jesus in the boat, tells us in John chapter 6, when they invited, they saw Christ walking on the water, you remember? And they invited him in the boat. The Bible says they were at their destination, even though when they were rowing stuck, they were in the middle of the sea. They invited Jesus in the boat. That boat was beamed. It was transported to the shore. Sometimes you think, how am I ever going to get across the sea in this storm? First of all, Jesus told the disciples to cross the sea. He did not say there was going to be calm sailing. So sometimes the Lord will ask you to do something. He's not promising it's going to be easy, but he will help you do what he wants you to do. They were doing their very best to get that boat across. And when they invited Jesus in the boat, they got there. Another interesting aspect of that storm, when they first saw Jesus walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost and they were afraid. And Jesus said, don't be afraid, it's me. And Peter said, 
Lord, if it's you, command that I come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. You know, very few prayer requests that Jesus says no to. And Peter's the only one who had the gumption to get out of the boat. And uh, he stepped out of the boat and he felt something solid under his feet. I don't know whether it felt like a waterbed or it was like concrete that was wet. I don't know exactly, but all I know is it says he began to walk on water along with Jesus. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried that. <laughs> but, you know, unless you got water skis or a big piece of styrofoam or something, it doesn't work. We went to the uh, Salton Sea, the Salt Sea, Dead Sea. And the salt content in the Dead Sea is so uh, powerful, it's so intense and thick that you float. I mean, a lot more than normal. And you can sit there in the water. Pastor Ross was with us. I was trying to swim and I couldn't get my feet under the water to kick. They kept going up. It, it was the strangest thing. And you're in the water, you're like floating this high out of the water because of the salt content. That's as close as I ever got to walking on water. It was in the Holy Land, so I, I'd like to take credit for it. But, <laughs> but normally you can't do that. It's impossible. But you know, if, if Jesus tells you to come, then everything is possible. He said, come to me. And as long as Peter had his eyes on Jesus, he was able to do the impossible. Now, I'd like to suggest that living a holy Christian life in this wicked world is impossible unless you keep your eyes on Jesus. Amen. You read in Hebrews, let us lay aside the sin that does so easily beset us. This is chapter 12. And let us run with persistence the race Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus is how we lay aside the weight and the sin that besets us. Amen. You can do the impossible if you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Don't think that your devil is bigger than your God. Amen. Some people give the devil more credit for tempting them than God for keeping them from temptation. They were rowing and they could not get to shore. And finally... In exasperation, they cried out, and the sailors prayed. Jonah said, look, you guys aren't going to make it unless you sacrifice me. Jonah is a willing sacrifice. And uh, was Jesus a willing sacrifice? Yes. Jonah says, you need to throw me overboard. And uh, they didn't want to do it. He, they could have said, well, why don't you just jump? <laughs> right? They said, we'll put the plank up, just walk the plank. And he says, you must offer me. No sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. We must offer Christ. He died for the world, but you must make him your personal Lord and Savior and accept him as your sacrifice, Amen. where he takes all of your sins. So with great reluctance, the sailors pray. We pray, O oh Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life. Friends, that's the gospel right there. Because of Jesus' life, we may not perish. And do not charge us with innocent blood. Christ was innocent. Pilate, at the trial of Christ, he washes his hand before the people and said, I will not have this innocent man's blood on my hands. And the mob shouted, let his blood be upon us and our children. Same words that you find in the gospel. So they picked up Jonah. I suspect four of the sailors grabbed him. The boat is rocking and pitching and creaking and groaning. They, they tried to row. The sea was getting worse and worse. They'd thrown everything overboard. They could throw overboard except Jonah. You notice how quickly they're willing to make any sacrifice to uh, save themselves? They're making that trip to make money by transporting goods. But what good is it if you gain the whole world and you lose your soul? A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things that he, op that he owns. And what good is it if you're the richest body in the graveyard? <laughs> Jesus tells a parable about this man whose crops brought forth abundantly. And he said, oh, good deal. He says, my barn's not big enough. Here's what I'm going to do. I'll build bigger barns and I'll make more jars and I'll store more goods and then I can eat, drink, and be merry instead of thinking about how he could share with others because God blessed him. He was just hoarding 
and storing for himself. And Jesus said in the parable, that night God said, oh, you fool, this night your soul is required of you and whose will those things be that you stored away? You never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. You can't take it with you, friends. And they were willing to sacrifice everything. They threw it all overboard. So, but they're scared. And you know, when the captain's scared and when the crew's scared, then it's a real storm. I've done a lot of flying, and uh, I'm a pilot. And Karen and I had a plane for several years, small plane, not like a televangelist plane, just one little propeller out front. <laughs> and that's to keep the pilot cool. <laughs> because if it stops working, he starts to sweat, <laughs> really. So we had a little plane. We flew around for years, and I enjoy flying. My father was a pilot. And I fly, and we go through all kinds of turbulence, and it starts to bounce a little bit. And I see people pulling out their rosaries, and they start, you know, and their knuckles are getting white on the armrest, and I don't really worry about it. And then sometimes the captain will come on the air, and he'll say, um, I'd like to ask the crew if you could please take your seats and buckle up. Well, then you know that's a little more serious. But I once saw a turbulence where the chief flight attendant told all of the crew to sit where they were. And they were in the aisles and they sat down in the aisles. When the captain's nervous, you've got something to worry about. So they don't want to do it. But the last thing was to throw Jonah overboard. And it says here, then the men picked up Jonah. I'm in verse 15, and they swung him one, two, three. And they pitched him with a great ark off the boat, and he plopped off in the raging waters. And as soon as Jonah hit the waters, the waves just began to flatten out. The wind instantly died. There wasn't a ripple on the water. The clouds parted, and the moon came out. And the Bible says, when the sailors saw this, as soon as they picked up Jonah, threw him in the sea, the sea ceased. It's an instant stopping from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly. First they're afraid of the storm, then they're afraid of the Lord. Did that happen in the story of Jesus? When he calmed the sea, they were afraid of the storm. When Jesus calmed the sea, they were afraid of the Lord. Same, same story. Same symbolism. And then it tells us now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. All right, we got to talk about this. Now, this is a little deeper right here, and I'm hoping you can stay with me. Three days and three nights. And Jesus said, no sign will be given. Now, in Matthew 12, it's the only place Christ says this. In Matthew 12, you can start reading in verse 38. He said, it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah, the prophet, was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Three days and three nights. People say, it's talking about when Jesus was in the tomb, but then they do the math and they go, well, he was crucified Friday. He went to the tomb Friday night and he rose Sunday morning. That's Friday night, Saturday night. It's two nights. But Jesus said three nights, very specific. And I've seen folks try and change the crucifixion day and they try to readjust the Bible and, or say the Bible's not true and they get all bent out of shape because of this and they misunderstand because they're looking at the wrong verse that they're misunderstanding. The problem is not the three days and three nights. That's all perfectly accurate. They're making an assumption about the heart of the earth. They believe the heart of the earth means just the tomb. The tomb is part of it. But the heart of the earth, first of all, when you say the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven, does that mean the tomb? No, it means in us, in the world. So when Jesus said in the heart of the earth, he meant the Son of Man is going to be in the clutches of this world. The word there in Greek, heart, is cardia. You know, under cardiac, it's the same word. And the word for world is talking about the world, the planet, earth. You see, the devil is called the prince of this world. Those are Jesus' words. Every time the devil tried to arrest Jesus or to have a mob kill Jesus, he passed through their fingers. They tried to throw Jesus off a cliff in Nazareth. He walked right through them. Now they took up stones to stone him. He passed away into the crowd. And they, 
They never could get their hands. Herod tried to destroy him as a baby. Christ escaped. But on Thursday night, after the Lord had the Last Supper with the disciples, and Judas went out, the Bible tells us in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times it says, Jesus declared, now is the hour. Now is the hour. Before, we, he even told his own mother, Mother, my hour has not yet come. But now, after he'd surrendered, he prayed three times in the garden, not my will, thy will be done. Then the hour came. Jesus woke up the disciples. He said, you can wake up now. Now the hour has come. The mob came. Judas kissed him. They tied his hands. He did not break the ropes like Samson. They began to beat him. They began to torture him. They carried him off. The disciples were flabbergasted. Jesus had never, this had never happened before. For three days and three nights, Jesus was paying the penalty for our sins. Now, what is the penalty for sin? Not just death. It is suffering and death. Do the wicked just die? Or do they suffer according to their works? Right? Jesus not only took your death. I mean, you could have given him a lethal injection. But no, he suffered and died because he took our suffering that we deserve. When did his suffering begin? Thursday night, he was in the hands of the devil and a mob just like Jonah was in the belly of that great fish. And Jesus was paying the penalty for sin, the suffering and death. Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, he rose Sunday morning. See what, the, what that's talking about? Bible fits perfectly. The heart of the earth is not just the tomb. It's talking about being in the clutches of the devil in the world is what that's talking about. Does that make sense? Okay, that'll be in your gift book that's available tonight. So, Jonah is there in the whale, and he's praying. And uh, I would be praying too. <laughs> Finally, God gets his attention. And if you think about it, it would be like suffering, like Jesus suffered in the sense of the, the terrible environment and the heat and the stench and surrounded by semi-digested sushi and there could have been jellyfish in there that were flashing every now and then. There could have been some kind of, you know, stinging him or uh, other sea urchins or who knows what else was in the menu that day. And Jonah's in there and it smells awful and the acids of the stomach is burning him and, and he's getting seasick. He's riding around on this blubber bed and it's dark and he goes to the bottom of the oceans. Now Jonah is as far away from God as anyone can be. By the way, in his prayer that you read in chapter 2, we don't have time to read it all, it also talks about he had seaweed wrapped around his head. Did Jesus have a crown of thorns wrapped around his head? And he went to the bottom of the mountains. Christ went to the very lowest part of suffering for you and me. But from that place he prayed. Now this is what's really encouraging when you think about it. Have you ever thought I'm so far from God he can never hear, hear me? I'm just too far away. Jonah is about as far away from God as anyone could be. He is inside a whale. or We, we don't know if it was a whale or a great fish. And he's in the bottom of the mountains. He's in the dark. He's a long way from church and he prays. And he says in his prayer, I will pray to your temple. Does God hear his prayer? He does. And God has mercy on Jonah. The fish brings him back up. Now the fish could have burped him out in the middle of the ocean somewhere. But God commands the fish and it takes him all the way to the shore. And he burps him out on the shore right on the land. And he basically beaches himself. And I heard one pastor say, a hypocrite will even make a whale sick. <laughs> so it says the whale vomited him. And he came splashing out there and, and uh, he looked pretty bad, but he felt pretty good because he's alive. And Jonah's probably thinking now, all right, Lord, I've learned my lesson. I had a hard time and I'm going to go home and I've got to recover from this. But what happens? You look at chapter 3 of Jonah and it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time. It said, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it. Had the word of God changed between chapter 1 and chapter 3? 
even after everything Jonah had been through, the Word of God does not change, friends. The heavens and earth will pass away. Not one jot or one tittle will in any wise pass from the law of God. His Word does not change. We are what needs changing. And God was saying, now are you prepared to obey me? Jonah said, I am on my way. <laughs> After you've been through a near-death experience, you're ready to listen. And he goes to Nineveh. Listen carefully, friends. That great city to preach. And it says, Nineveh is an exceeding great city. This is Jonah chapter 3, at verse 3. Three days journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's journey and said, in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Do you forget everything I said? Remember this. Jesus said, no sign will be given but the sign of Jonah. What is a day equal in prophecy? A year. The Bible says in prophecy, a day is a year. Jonah goes three days, enters the city half a day, then preaches in 40 days, it'll be destroyed. Jesus was baptized. He came out of the water, like Jonah came out of the water. Jesus preached for three and a half years. And he said, this generation will not pass away till all these things be fulfilled and there will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down in the temple and Jerusalem would be destroyed. He said, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, I am to this generation. Jesus preached three and a half years that in 40 years they'd be destroyed. He made that prophecy in AD 30, in AD 70, Jerusalem was destroyed. That is a sign of Jonah. He was warning them. He also said, as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so the Son of Man is to this generation. That's in the book of Luke. And I think Jonah is also a sign to you and me that it doesn't pay to run from God and to disobey the Lord. Amen? Amen? Now you might be thinking, how could this ever really happen? Is this a true story? Let me tell you another true story I think you're going to find amazing. There was the cook, a cook on a tugboat. His name was Harrison O'Keen. And uh, Harrison, in um, May 26, 2013, was on this tugboat about 20 miles off the coast of Nigeria when a rogue wave hit the tugboat and capsized it, and it sank in about 100 feet of water. All of the crew was trapped inside and drowned, except Harrison. There were 12 in the crew. Harrison was sleeping. It was in the middle of the night. The boat went upside down, and to get air, instead of going down, he had to chase it to the bottom of the boat because the boat was capsized and it landed on the bottom upside down. But there was a pocket of air that was trapped. And if you're looking at your screen here, that's actually a picture that was taken when the rescuers found him. He was there for 72 hours. Now, the amazing thing is that day his wife had sent him a text Praise the Lord for good wives. I've got a good wife. <laughs> Spiritual wives. Psalm 54, verse 1 and verse 4, she said, memorize this. Save me, O God, by your name. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is with those who uphold my life. Well, they sent a Dutch salvage crew, not to rescue, because they figured everyone's dead. And when the salvage crew came down, going through the ship three days later to recover the bodies, as they're finding the bodies and they're pulling them out, they got video camera on their head. They're talking with these cables. They're connected by cable to the ship that's way above. It's not like scuba diving. They stay connected. And Harrison is running out of air. The only thing he had to drink in three days was there was one can of Coke that floated up. And um, he had heard the sea creatures that were bang banging around in the ship, presumably eating his, his crewmates. And he kept repeating the promise that his wife had given. Deliver me, deliver me, deliver me. And uh, soon he was running out of air. And he began to hallucinate. And it looked like the water was glowing. And he thought, this is it. But he wasn't hallucinating. The divers were coming up the gangway with their lamps on. And then he saw something moving. He thought, oh, the sharks are coming after me. And he went to hit at it. Now, you should hear the video of this because you can actually watch it. The rescue diver who's looking for dead bodies and all of a sudden a hand comes down and grabs him. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
He had the fright of his life. <laughs> and then you hear him say, we have a survivor. Well, through a complicated process, they pumped air into the chamber and they managed to get Harrison out and he went to shore and he is not going to see anymore. <laughs> but he was three days and three nights trapped in that ship claiming the promises of God and God saved him. God still works miracles. Amen? Amen? Now, I want you to know the rest of Jonah. It's, a, it's an amazing story. When Jonah was running from God, everybody was perishing. The sailors were perishing. The captain was perishing. The, everything was going down. The people in Nineveh were perishing. When Jonah finally surrendered and he went and he preached in Nineveh, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Thirdly, who they thought, who's this kook? 39 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. 38 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. They got convicted. The king said they all needed to repent. And soon the whole capital city of Nineveh repented of their sins. And you have the biggest revival and conversion in the Bible that happens in the city of Nineveh from the preaching of one reluctant prophet. God wants to do that again in the world today. When he stopped running from God, people around him were being saved. When he was running from God, people around him were perishing. What happened to Jonah happens to each of us. By your life and your influence, it's not just about you. If you're disobeying God, others will go down with you. When you turn to God, others will be redeemed. Amen. Amen. God has a plan for you. He wants to save you. But beyond that, he wants to save others through you. Amen. But first, you must come and surrender. Uh, he may send storms to get your attention, but whatever it takes. Amen? Amen? Why not do it now? God says, hear the word of the Lord and obey. Do it now, and God will bless you. How many of you believe that? Amen. You want to say tonight, Lord, I'm willing to do your will and surrender to him. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the promise in your word that you are willing to do great things to redeem and you want to do great things to save us and to reach others through us. Help us surrender to your will and give us that peace and power. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, friends. And now, when is our next meeting? Tomorrow night. And then we're going to be Thursday night and Friday night. Don't miss tomorrow night. Cleanse from the sin of leprosy. You're going to enjoy that. And tell your friends to join in as well. God bless you.